Okie dokie. Last week, uh, we were at the end of Genesis 14. We're going to be at the beginning of Genesis 15 this week. If you want to open your Bibles to Genesis 15. Last week, we talked about Abram rescuing his nephew Lot. And it was a testament, of course, to Abram's growing faith in the Lord. Uh, also, his, uh, his faith that even in the midst of chaos, the chaos of war, that Abram knew that God was going to save him and to rescue him. And so we, hit, we saw how God's hand was working in Abram's life and how that blessing that came upon Abram blessed, I mean, nations, right? Because Abram didn't just save his nephew Lot, but he saved those that were also captured by those mighty uh, armies. Anyway, uh, in this, the aftermath of victory, we, we saw how you know, battles often rage on within our hearts and our minds. And so uh, we're going to read a little bit about how there's a new battle that arise, ar- arises in Abram's heart in Genesis 15. We're going to see Abram wrestling with these tensions that he has within himself between uh, just God's faithfulness and just seemingly impossible uh, things that God has promised him. But before we get into the Lord's word, I'd like to pray one more time. Heavenly Father, we gather here today uh, with our hearts full of uh, just of, of gratitude and, and thankfulness for your presence and your power. Father, we, we thank you for the victory that you've given Abram and that we saw last week, a victory that echoes to the ages, ages and speaks to us, Lord. But we want to consider the passage that we have of, for this week, uh, and I ask that you would open our, ha- our, our hearts, our, our minds, um, just to see how your hand works within the lives of your people. I ask that our hearts would be able to receive your truth, that our minds would be able to see, receive your word, that we would be challenged, that we would be inspired, that we would be transformed by your word, Father. So we love you. We thank you. We ask a blessing over our time together. Um, We just ask that we would just draw near to you. We love you. We thank you. We ask all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Genesis 15, starting in verse 1. I'm reading from the Legacy Standard. Um, I like the way they word things. Anyway, uh, after these things, the word of Yahweh came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. And Abram said, O Lord, Yahweh, what will you give me? As I go on being childless and the heir of my house and is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Since you have given no seed to me, behold, one born in my house is my heir. Abram said, Since you have given no seed to me, then behold, the the word of Yahweh came to him saying this, uh, or this one will uh, not be your heir but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. Behold, one born in my house uh, is my heir. And he brought him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and number the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your seed be. And then he believed in Yahweh, and he counted to him, counted it to him as righteousness. Sorry. That's wrong, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I... I pasted in the middle of the verse. Anyway, can someone read that for me? Verse 4. I don't care what version you have. Nice and loud. Butch, do you have it? Can you read aloud for me? Yeah, thank you. That's the verse. All right. So God tells Abram that it's not the heir that he thinks it is, but it's the heir that he will give him. And so we have the battlefield, right? Abram goes out to battle against thousands, tens of thousands, and he has an army of 300. 318 plus himself is 319. He comes back home. He comes, starts coming back home, and he's met by two kings. He's met by the king of Sodom, who says, you can have all the spoils of war. And then he's met by King Melchizedek, the king of Salem. And the king of Salem says, would you want to have communion with me? And Abram picks communion because that's the right thing to pick. He picks the priest of God, and he says, I want nearness to God, not nearness to the world. So Abram picks the right thing. And then as soon as he's done picking the right thing, so he fights a mighty war, wins, comes home, and instead of receiving the spoils of war, he says, I still want to honor God. And so after that, he's, he's by himself. He's quiet. It's quiet, silent. And God speaks to him in a vision. And so you could uh, imagine that there's these emotions, these highs that he's, that he's gone under, right? The conflict has, has faded, and now he's under the twilight of a sky. And he's weary, but he's victorious. 
And he, re, he again, he's returning from this daring rescue. He's probably carrying the weight of those the battle on his shoulders. Probably thinking of the many ways that God saved his life. He wants to just bring his family back home. And in that quiet solitude of his tent, a new battle begins to rage within Abram's heart. And it's not people, it's emotions. A battle that he's raging, that's raging on, it's about doubt and it's about uncertainty. And he remembers the promise of God. And it was clear and it was vibrant at one time in his life. But now that clear, vibrant promise that God gave to him seems to be just going farther and farther away. And so it's beautiful because God comes to Abram before Abram even says anything. God saw Abram's heart. And he comes to Abram and he says to him, Do not fear. Don't be afraid. He says, I'm your shield. I am your reward, or your reward shall be very great. And you think, oh, that's awesome. Abram must have been like pumped to hear that from God. I mean, could you imagine God coming to you in a vision? I've never had the Lord come to me in a vision and say anything to me, right? A Abram hears the voice of God in a vision. And instead of him jumping for joy, he responds with, with a word of, of anguish, really. And so there's this divine initiative that God is coming to Abram. God wants uh, Abram to know that he cares and he loves for him. And so Abram, he doesn't want Abram to cry out in despair. And so instead, God reaches out first. And he offers his comfort, this reassurance, before Abram even art articulates what his anxieties or what his depressions or what his issues are. And so it's this picture of God's preemptive, beautiful grace that he's bestowing on so many people, if not all. And so the phrase, the word of the Lord came to Abram, that is a phrase that echoes throughout the Old Testament time and time again. It's a familiar frame that signifies a divine encounter between man and God. It's moments where God breaks into human experience and reveals himself. He reveals his will. He reveals his purposes for mankind. But this encounter, it's not just about communication. God wants to have communion. It's beautiful because we'll be taking part of communion later. God doesn't just speak to Abram. He speaks with Abram. There's a conversation that happens here. Oftentimes we see God sitting in, on his throne and he's in heaven and he kind of commands down to earth and says, what shall happen? But this is a God that has a, has a conversation with this man. Our God is personal. He's loving. He's kind. He's generous. He's relational. He wants to have a relationship with his people. And so we see this idea that God is communicating with Abram through a vision. It's a supernatural experience. It's a reminder that God's ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our, our thoughts, as Isaiah 55 tells us. He sees what we cannot see. He knows what we cannot know. He offers us a perspective that's far beyond our perspective. It's far beyond our limited human understanding. So God's first words to Abram are words to comfort him, to encourage him. Do not fear. Again, it's that common refrain that we find throughout scriptures. The psalmist says in Psalms 27.1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? With God, we have to nothing to fear but Abram isn't going to complain about his fear of facing other people or his fear of the world so to speak he's afraid that God's promise won't come true and how oftentimes is that a fear that we have and so God's reassurance hangs in the air on that first verse He's going to be a divine shield against Abram's fears. And so even in the face of that comfort, Abram's heart is still at odds. It's still wrecked, it seems. It's still wrestling with, with the weight of this deep longing that he has. And so he responds to God 
And a question, really, says, O Lord God, what will you give me for I continue childless? And he says, I'm childless, oh, now you've promised me something that you're not going to give me, it seems. And so my heir isn't going to be my son. My heir is going to be Eliezer, a faithful servant of mine. And he's not even from where I'm from. He's from Damascus. So Abram's words, they're really this raw and honest expression of his heart towards God. And the one beautiful thing is that our God doesn't care if we come to him with our anxieties and our, our problems. There's no perfect way to pray. There's no perfect way to talk with God. It's okay to just talk to him. right? Think of Abram. Abram hears, sees this vision. Hears, the, hears God's voice. I'm your shield. Don't fear. Your reward's going to be great. And he says, you haven't given me an heir. Instead, my heir is going to be Eliezer. You can hear it in his voice. You can hear it in the words. He's not questioning God's faithfulness. He knows that God has spared his life and that God is protecting him. Instead, it's this longing for a son that he has, and it's, it's something that's bothering him. It's that yearning of the fulfillment of the promise that God has made to him. It's something that he's been waiting for. And I hear this plea, and I think of my own wanting for a child. When Amy and I were barren, it was a dark time. It was a hard time. I mean, we tried everything that we could, and nothing ever worked. I didn't try what Abram w did eventually. We won't get into that right now. But I remember crying out to the Lord for him to take away the desire to have children if he was never going to give me a child. And that was a hard prayer to pray. But my God saw me and he heard me. And are we not such children to say, God, if you don't give me what I want, you put in whatever. God knows, he sees, he hears, he cares. And so Abram's question isn't a question of malice. He's not angry with God. He's confused. He doesn't know. And so it's a reminder that even in the most faithful, that the most faithful among us experience those moments of doubt. They experience moments of frustration. They experience moments where they cry out to God saying, please, don't you hear me? Don't you care? And God speaks to us, not always the way that we want him to. The psalmist captures this same sentiment in Psalms 13, 1 and 2. He says, how long, O Lord, how long will you forget me forever? How, will, how long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? God, how long? So Abram's struggle is not just about the absence of a child. It's a pain that he has. It's a pain of the unfulfilled promise because you've got to think, God comes to him and says, I will make your name great. You'll be a blessing to all the earth. Through your descendants, all the earth will be blessed. And he says, I have no kids. What are you talking about? And so he believes, but now that belief over years and years and years and years and years, starts to fade. The promise remains a distant dream that he seems to have. And so this tension between God's promises and realities, they often happen in our life, not just in Abram's life. And it's common throughout the scriptures to see our heroes of the faith go through times of doubt and struggle. The Israelites wander in the wilderness for 40 years and they grumble against Moses and Aaron. They question God's faithfulness. Yet they are the ones that saw God split the sea. They saw God bring the 10 plagues upon Egypt. And yet they still murmured and complained against God and his deliverance for them. The disciples witnessed Jesus's crucifixion and they were the ones that saw Jesus perform miracles for three years. And yet they're still filled with despair and confusion at his death. Their hopes were dashed. Their dreams were shattered. Because we can't see and we can't know what God sees and what God knows. 
And so when our faith wanes, and when it seems to fall away, God's faith doesn't. His promises stand true and faithful. And it's okay to bring our doubts and our complaints and our whatevers to God. Say, God, I don't know, and I'm confused, and I want to know. Why is this happening to me? Why am I going through these things? It's okay for us to go to God and say those things to Him. He's a big God. He can take it. And He knows. And so we can be honest and we can be vulnerable and we can be ourselves with our God because He loves us. He's not intimidated by our questions. He's not offended by our doubts. He is a loving Father who invites us to come to Him with our struggles. He wants us to seek Him for, his, for comfort and for guidance even in the midst of our pain. So Abram's heartfelt plea, it hangs in the air and he says, God, why? God, when? I have Eliezer. And so God in his infinite wisdom and compassion, he doesn't leave a Abram languishing or upset in his despair. Instead, he responds with this resounding declaration right, that cuts through the darkness of doubt and he says, this man will not be, shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. Is that a new promise? God's promises never change. He may say them a little differently, but it's the same promise. It's the same truth. It's the same God. But it's what Abram needs to hear in that moment. And so the, the words are direct. They answer Abram's longing. God is not offering vague assurance of distant hopes. He's making a very specific and personal promise. Eliezer, even though he's a faithful servant and he probably is a great guy, he's not going to inherit Abram's legacy. Abram will have a son, and Abram can't see that yet. Born from Abram's own flesh and blood, this, there will be a child who will carry his name. He's going to fulfill the covenant promises that God has made to Abram, and it's in that moment of profound significance that God is not simply addressing Abram's immediate concerns, but he's refer, reaffirming his eternal plans because our lives are not about us. Abram's wanting for a son wasn't, God's plan isn't about Abram's wanting. God's plan is about God's plan because in God's plan, all good things come. So God knows the perfect timing. God knows the perfect plan. You say, well, why couldn't God just give him Isaac sooner? Because that wouldn't have been according to plan, and it wouldn't have worked out the way it needed to work out for God's plan, God's purposes to come to pass. When we think that we know better than God is when we can assuredly say we know nothing. God's promises are not empty. They're living realities, right? And he has a purpose and a plan and a will. And so he invites Abram to step outside his tent. And he says to Abram to, to do the thing that he's done before. He says, look up at the stars of the heavens. He says, if you're able to number them, then you'll also be able to number your descendants. Right? He says, look toward heaven, number the stars, if you are able to number them. Verse 5. And so Abram looks up into the stars. He sees the countless stars twinkling above his head. And so that then he sees this m visual metaphor for how big and how great and how wonderful God is. And I think this is an example to us so oftentimes is that we get stuck in our own little worlds and say, what about me? God, what about me? What about my feelings? 
What about my wants? What about my desires? And God says, it's not about you. Step outside. Look at this. Look at what I, God, have made. We live on a tiny little planet. I mean, it's tiny. A tiny little planet set in an immense universe. If we go out and you see, if you go over to the sidewalk, I guarantee you'll see it, a little little hill next to the sidewalk or in the sidewalk, and there's these little black bugs that crawl in and out of there, right? They call them ants, right? And there's a whole colony inside, under, in that hill, right? Underneath the ground, there's this colony of ants. And what do my kids and what do I oftentimes do? You know, you just, because there's these tiny little insects and they seem insignificant and they're itty bitty. If you were, if you take some of those pictures that we have, the drawings of the immense size of the universe, I mean, we're just nothing. We're tinier than the ants, right? We're, we're just simple and small. And so God says, do you see what I have made? Do you see what I have done? Do you see the magnitude of my universe? And just like Job, who are you? Who are you to say to me, were you there when I created all of these things? And the answer is no, absolutely not. So God says, look at the stars. Are you able to number the stars? Abram's not. He says, so will your offspring be. And so this promise is reaffirmed to Abram about his descendants and the n how numerous they will be. And it's a promise that defies our human logic. It's a promise that can only be, be fulfilled by the power of the Almighty God. And so this encounter challenges Abram. It says, stop thinking about yourself because this isn't your plan. This is God and his plan. And it says after this that Abram responds with one of the most significant responses in all of scriptures. And so he looks up at the vastness of the starry sky and it's this breathtaking spectacle. For whatever reason, it seems to change and shift his perspective. Hearing the words from God. Remember how God started. I'm, don't be afraid of anything. I will be your shield. Right? And and I you are going to be blessed. God bless you. And so it's this, and he said, and so then Abram responds, Well, what about me? And God says, Get take a breath, take a breath. Go outside, take a breath of air, look at the sky. Step back and look. And so the divine promise echoes in his ears, so shall your offspring be. And he's he's looking at the stars. And so he looks at the stars, and Abram is old. His wife is barren. And somehow in that, in these few verses of all of this that happens, Abram says, or it says that Abram believed the Lord. That's it. He believed the Lord, and then the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. What is there for us to do? Believe on the Lord. That's what we're called to do. That's what Abram does. It's simple, but it's so profound. Because think of the war that's raging on within Abram. I'm going to give you a son, you will be, and that son will give you so many children. You will be the great-great-grandfather of a, a, a massive nation. That nation will be a blessing to all the earth. And then Abram does some dumb things. He goes to Egypt, makes a bad decision in Egypt about his wife. God fixes that situation. Abram comes out of it. The next big thing is he hears Lot uh, complaining about the shepherds. And he says, hey, go your way. I'll go my way. You take what you want. I'll, I'll take what's left over. And so Lot takes the plains of the valley where Sodom is, and Abram heads back to Bethel to go hear from God. God reiterates the promise. 
Years go by, Lot's captured. And so Abram, this is 12 years later between Lot and him separating. Abram hears of Lot being captured. He says, let's go take the men and get Lot back. They go and take Lot back. And so it's this, God, thank you for saving my life. And then God says, who do you choose, the world or you choose me? And, God, and so Abram chooses Melchizedek because that was the choice, Sodom or Melchizedek. He chooses Melchizedek. And so could you imagine, he's done everything right. Lord, I have followed you. I have prayed to you. I have honored you with my life. And you promised me a son. But here I am, old, with no son. What's it worth? And God says, stop. Don't be afraid. Right? Go count the stars. And in that moment, it's what Abram needed to hear. And he says, it says that he believed. He didn't respond to God after that. It doesn't say he responded. It just says, and he believed. And it's in that belief, God counts it to him as righteousness. And it's then he has this perfect obedience. And it's not like he was perfect. He didn't have a flawless character. He wasn't the most impressive person to ever, ever live but it is that he had belief in God's promise. And I think he realized in that moment it wasn't about him. It wasn't about what he was doing. It was about God and what God was doing. In Romans 4, Paul writes in verse 3, For what does the Scripture say? Abram believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. In 4.20 of Romans, Paul writes, No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. In Hebrews 11, the hall of faith, Abram is celebrated as a hero. In Hebrews 11.8, it says that he, a man, went out not knowing where he was going, but he was willing to take the steps of faith and to believe in his God. And so his faith was not a blind leap into the unknown. It was actually a confident step forward into trusting in what God was doing and in God's plan. Now God had called him and promised to be with him always. So this is why Abram is known as the father of faith. is because he many times had to have that faith tried over and over and over again. And Abram wasn't perfect through it all. But in uh, Galatians 3, 6 through 9, I won't read the whole thing. Galatians 3 says, Paul writes again, Just as Abram believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, so then those who are of faith, are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And so this is what we're called to be and what we're called to have is faith in God. And when we step back and say, God, I don't know why this is happening. He says, it's okay. Have faith. Believe me when I say whatever it is. He tells us he loves us. His promises are true. I like what Warren Wiersbe says. God reminds, or God's remedy for Abram, Abraham's fear was not to remind him of who he was, even though that's what he did with Job. God knows us. He says, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. God's I am is perfectly adequate for man's I am not. And so be still and know that I am God. Your life is only as big as your faith. Your faith is only as big as your God. If you spend all your time looking at yourself, you're going to get discouraged. But if you look to God by faith, you will be encouraged. Stop thinking about yourself. And I know that's a hard thing to do because you're stuck with yourself all the time. But if we can take our eyes off ourselves and we put our eyes on God and his creation and who he is, our lives actually get better.
Doesn't mean that we're going to live the easiest life. Doesn't mean that we'll have the best life. It doesn't mean that everything's going to go our way. But we'll be able to at least honor God with our lives and do what God has called us to do. And so the story of Abram's faith in Genesis 15 is this profound, transformative message for us. It's a message that echoes through the corridors of time. It resonates with believers in every generation. It's how we face doubt and uncertainty. Abram chose to believe God's promise, a promise that he thought was impossible. But Abram's faith was not a blind leap. He trusted in God's character and God's power, and it was his faith that allowed him to carry on. His faith wasn't perfect. God was perfecting it in him. Nor was his faith without its struggles. We see how human he was. And so, but the heart of God is this message that we are not saved by our own works or our own doing. We are saved by God's righteousness. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So Abram's faith was credited to him as righteousness. Our faith in Christ is what credits us as righteousness. It's not about our own goodness, because our own goodness could never save us. It is the righteousness of Christ Jesus that has been imputed unto us through faith. Praise the Lord. Romans 4.22, Paul writes, I don't have time to read the whole thing, but that it is why, or that is why, so faith is counted to him as righteousness, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So Abram looked to the starry sky and he believed God's promises. And we look to the cross of Jesus Christ and we believe in the promises of eternal life. And so our faith, like Abram's, it's not based on what we see, but it's based on the word and promises of God. And so hopefully we can take our eyes off ourselves for a small period of time and look to God and have faith in what he is doing and have faith in our creator and say, even though I don't know why this is the life that you have chosen for me, I will still have faith, I will still believe, and I will still draw near the God who loves me, who sent his son to die on a cross for me. It's the only hope that we have. It's the hope that brings us joy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that you've given us to look into your word. We thank you for the gift of faith, Father, the gift that enables us to trust in your promises. Even when we can't see the way ahead, Lord, we thank you for the example of Abram. You see how his faith was counted to him as righteousness, Father, and help us to have faith. Help us to follow in your footsteps, Lord. Help us to believe in your word. Help us to trust in your unfailing love and in your faith, your faithfulness, Father. We know that we cannot do it alone and that we oftentimes fail. Father, this is why we need you so much. We love you. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives. We ask for our time uh, in communion this morning, Lord, that we would be drawn near to you. Help us to remember the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. Help us to remember his body that was broken, his blood that was spilled all for our sake, that we would be able to have a relationship with you. We love you. We thank you. We ask the blessing over the remainder of our time together. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.